Good morning, all. Happy Sabbath, all. Pray no serious accidents happen, else you would not be here. But we've been through some trials this week, have we not? Each one of us. And um, I just want to share something before I start. I normally like to give a little talk. I am working with a a young lady that I met in New York, about my daughter's age. Um, she's an atheist, an avid atheist. She's read all sorts of fiction. She talks to a psychic. You might ask, what do you do with a person who's an atheist? What do you talk about? A person who is keen to the Christian ways of, you know, getting a new convert. She's read the Bible. She's read portions of the Bible, I would say, um, from what she's told me. She has talked to numerous Christians of, of, of different denominations. And there was some disconnect over the past couple of months. Um, I lost contact with her. Just this week, I get a call out of nowhere from, from this young lady. And um, she had been in the hospital. Um, not to divulge too much business, but there's drugs involved. There's mental illness involved. So you have all this tied in with, the, with the, her belief system. And so all week I've been praying, Lord, I don't know what to say. Um, at first, because of her lifestyle, I thought she was dead. She's from New York. She's from the Bronx, New York. You know the, you know, the mortality rate <laughs> there is kind of above what we have here in Maine. So anyway, make a long story short, you know, just the other day, well, was it Thursday? Um, she was talking about, well, you know, I don't believe in God. I know how you, all you Christians, you know how they, they distance themselves when they talk to people who believe in God. And she says, you know, I believe in many gods. You know, I don't believe in one God. I believe the Buddhists are right in, in this. And so it's like, wow, so many angles. Well, anyway, I kept praying and said, Lord, I don't, you know, I talk about my faith, but she'll cut you off in a second. So I don't want to be abrasive. I don't want to you know, just shut her down and say, listen to me, here's what the, here's what the Bible says. Because she's heard it before. Huh? What do you do when someone's heard it before? And so, like I said the other day, she brought up a book to me. And I believe it's something about Beyond the Pale Horse by William Cooper. He used to be a naval, naval officer. And in this book, I have not read the book. I just was happened to be last Sabbath evening watching a video called The Jesuit Infiltration into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, made back in 93 or 94, um, by Bob Treffs and uh, a former pastor, I think uh, Pastor John something. Well, anyway, that's not important. Well, anyway, in the video, these two Adventist pastors mentioned a book by that very name, and I was like, I was blown. My mind was like, what? She read this book that they mentioned in the video. It's a book about the end times, about what's going on behind the scenes um, in the, all the churches and in, in the world. Well, anyway, it was that point that was an opening. The Holy Spirit gave me an opening. I said, praise God. Here it is, an atheist. Just yesterday evening, she sends me a text a picture of, of, of what looked like a vault, a library. And the caption read, the Vatican has 50 miles of ancient books, documents. 50 miles. This is an atheist sending this to me. So I want you to really pray for this young lady. I think I should, I'm impressed to give her, you her name. Her name is Anais Santos. She's Puerto Rican. So she's... So she's, she's, she's got a lot of Catholic background. Um, 
but she wants she's she has an open mind but she does not want to be uh, Christianized so the Holy Spirit can work in ways that we don't know and I can't give her anything in person I have no way of getting to New York and if I send something I don't know where she lives we just have each other's phone number but I, I want you all to pray really pray that God would really open the door her name is Anais Santos please don't forget that because God cares for everyone including us and our families he cares for her as much as he cares for my daughter who's her very age he knows her by name just like he knows us so just keep that in prayer um, would you pray with me Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath and how we're so privileged to have a day that you set aside after you created us in celebration of your creation. And so, Lord, we, we, we are so glad that we're in the house. But, Lord, our hearts are heavy for our loved ones, our children who are not in the faith. Our hearts are so heavy for even our own selves. We deal with so much inconsistency in our lives that... We know that it's by your grace. We know that it's by your mercy even more so that we're even allowed this time with you. But Lord, we thank you. Our hearts are grateful for it. Please bless our minds as we go in, we delve into our, our, our um, study this morning. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. How much of your heart? Now what's going to happen? You're going to seek me and find me. So God is not out there hiding from us. But he's, he's ready to be found of us. But only he's going to be found, what does it say? When ye shall search for me with all your heart look at verse 10 of that same chapter that gives us the backdrop of this for thus saith the lord that after 70 years be accomplished at babylon i will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place and we all know verse 11 for i know the thoughts that i think towards you saith the lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And here's our verse. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. This is God's promise. God's promise made to the children of Israel, telling them what would happen after this 70 years. That's a long time. We all know this story too well. They were backslidden in every which way, turned upside down all around in sin. They had been warned repeatedly over and over again to turn back to Jehovah, but to no avail. It's not complicated. As we look at those stiff-necked children, adults, yeah, but they were children, we see how they even told the prophets of God we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to hear you. Neither will we obey you. Let's fast forward to today. What does it take to get modern Israel, that is us, to the point where we'll fully be on God's side? By the way, the sermon is fully committed. What does it take for us to be fully committed to God? Does it take years and years of captivity of some sort? Whether it be another nation being over the control of the United States of America, or, or being under some sort of drug addiction? What does it take for us to see our need of him and how it's like a person who needs to be on life support, or even the baby, the unborn fetus who depends on his mother? for nourishment, to grow, to be born one day. How about that? Does it, are we, do we understand how serious it is? 
Like us today, they probably felt like backing off on how serious they should take Moses and Joshua's final consuls. They probably said, who is Moses? Is he God? Who is Joshua? And why is his word taken so seriously now? Seeing that he is dead, isn't he? It's been like a few hundred years, right? Why do we take it so seriously? I can hear them today. What, what do you think they would say about today? Can anyone tell me what they would be saying today? Yeah, who's Ellen White and why should we listen to her? And she's, yeah, she's dead and, you know, that's old. You heard of Statute of Limitations, huh? Anyone heard that? <laughs> yeah. That was ancient Israel. Backslidden children. Sounds like what you hear in our Adventist church today, doesn't it? But, hmm. All the true prophets, ancient and modern, simply wanted to see the people they loved saved. Period. That's all. It's not a rocket science gospel, is it? If I love you like Jesus loves you, I want to see, see you saved. And I will do whatever it takes to see you saved. I am fully committed, invested in you, a child of God, who, whom Jesus died for. We're going to look at something that I've read a few times. But we're going to read it today. It only takes about 10 minutes, and I think we have a little bit of time. It's from this book. You all recognize it? Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ. It's what you would give a non-believer, right? Someone who doesn't know Christ. But really, we need to read it over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's something that you can never, you will glean more and more from. The chapter I'm reading from is, called consecration. It's what the children of Israel had a problem with. It's what modern Israel has a problem with. Being fully committed to God. They had a problem with the passage of time <clears throat> and seeing that just because five years has passed since we, we said the Lord was coming, that doesn't mean you, you stop. You keep going. You rededicate your life every day to God. And they didn't see that. And it seems so plain to us, doesn't it? But so many times we back off and we say, oh, not so serious today, Lord. I'm not serious. I want to do my thing today. We all do that, don't we? I know I do. And I'll tell you a testimony at the end of... of how the Lord was fully committed to me. Mind you, I'm a pastor's kid. God had extra work. <laughs> <You're> extra bad. <laughs> well, anyway, let's, let's begin. If you have a smartphone, I'm reading directly from um, Steps to Christ. And do me a favor. While I'm reading, you're going to Think in your mind back to ancient Israel in Christ's day and before. Think back in your mind what's being said, what the prophet of the Lord is saying. And I'm going to stop every paragraph and give you a chance to think really quick. Who does, what story from the Bible does that remind you of? Let's begin. God's promise is, ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. The Holy, Scriptures, the Holy Spirit describes our condition in, which, in such words as these, dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, verse 1. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. No soundness in it, Isaiah 1, verse 5 and 6. We are held fast in the snare of Satan, taken captive 
by him at his will, 2 Timothy 2.26. God desires to heal us, to set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to him. How much? Wholly. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle. But that soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. What happens first? A submittal. Okay? Can't call, can't call ourselves holy without fully submitting to God. And we shouldn't call ourselves holy. The government of God is not, as Satan would make it appear, founded upon a blind submission and unreasoning control. It appeals to the intellect and conscience. Come now and let us reason together, Isaiah 1 verse 18, is the creator's invitation to the beings whom he has made. God does not force the will of his creatures. He cannot accept a homage that is not willingly and intelligently given. A mere forced submission would prevent all real development of mind or character. It would make man a mere automaton. Such is not the purpose of the creator. He desires that man, the crowning work of his creative power, shall reach the highest possible development. He sets before us the height of blessing to which he desires to bring us through his grace. He invites us to give ourselves to him that he may work his will in us. It remains for us to choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. I'm going to stop here. Anybody that came to your mind from the, from the Bible as I was reading that? I'll start it again. The government of God is not as Satan would make it appear founded upon a blind submission. Who in the Bible does that remind you of? Anyone? Well, you get the next paragraph. Just think of the whole Bible. I'll tell you who came to my mind. It was Eve. It was Eve. It was Eve. You know the charge that Satan brought. He wants, you know, God wants you to be naive. <laughs> he wants to keep you in the dark, okay? He doesn't, you know, you know. He just wants you to be obedient to him. He said, don't eat of this tree? Oh, come on. What did he, what did he really mean? You know, he, he really doesn't want you to become like him. So that's what that paragraph reminded me of. But it's not a blind submission. It's a willing heart it's done from intelligence, okay? Continuing on. In giving ourselves to God, we must necessarily give up all that would separate us from him. Hence the Savior says, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. Whatever shall draw away the heart from God must be given up. Mammon is the idol of many. The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the golden chain that binds them to Satan. Reputation and worldly honor are worshipped by another class. The life of selfish ease and freedom from responsibility is the idol of others. But these slavish bands must be broken. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. Who does that remind you of? I'm sorry? Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? How about... Balaam. He was straddling the fence. But not really. He was all the way on the devil's side. Yeah, he wanted to curse Israel. Balak told him to curse Israel. And that's found in Numbers 22 through 24. He wanted the money, yeah. Yes, yes. Next paragraph. This is Desire of Age. I mean, not Desire of Age. This is um, Steps of Christ, Chapter Consecration. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character and secure salvation. 
Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Such religion is worth nothing. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ will be the spring of action. Those who feel the constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. With earnest desire, they yield all and manifest an interest proportionate to the value of the object which they seek. A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. Anybody come to mind? Pharisees. Yes, thank you. The Pharisees of Christ, the Jews of Christ's day. They were good at that. They were experts at faking it. <laughs> yeah? Hypocrites. That's what John the Baptist called them, hypocrites. Okay, we'll go on. Do you feel that it is too great a sacrifice to yield all to Christ? Ask yourself the question. What has Christ given for me? Roderick, and you put your name in there. What has Christ given for each one of us individually? Give himself. <laughs> all to heaven. The Son of God gave all, life and love and suffering. Life and love and suffering. Why does she enumerate those three things? He could, she could have just said, well, he just loved us. Do you realize he lived for us? He suffered for us and died for us. There you go. Under the caption of love. And can it be that we, the unworthy objects of so great love, will withhold our hearts from him? Every moment of our lives, we have been partakers of the blessing of his grace. And for this very reason, we cannot fully realize the depths of ignorance and misery from which we have been saved. Can we look upon him whom our sins have pierced and yet be willing to do despite to all his love and sacrifice? In view of the infinite humiliation of the Lord of glory, shall we murmur? because we can enter into life only through conflict and self-abasement? The inquiry of a, many a proud heart is, why need I go in penitence and humiliation before I can have the assurance of my acceptance with God? I point you to Christ. He was sinless, and more than this, he was the Prince of Heaven. In man's behalf, he became sin for the race. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors, Isaiah 53, verse 12. But what do we give up when we give all? A sin-polluted heart for Jesus to purify, to cleanse by his own blood, and to save by his matchless love. And yet men think it hard to give up all. I am ashamed to hear of it spoken, ashamed to even write it. God does not require us to give up anything that is in our best interest to retain. In all that he does, he has the well-being of his children in view. Would that all who have not chosen Christ might realize that he has something vastly better to offer them than they are seeking for themselves. Man is doing the greatest injury and injustice to his own soul when he thinks and acts contrary to the will of God. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden by him who knows what is best who plans for the good of his creatures. The path of transgression is the path of misery and destruction. Anyone come to mind? Saul. Yeah, that's all. There's a judge in the book of Judges. Samson. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Listen to how the paragraph began. God does not require us to give up anything that is in our best interest to retain. Samson just wanted the Philistine woman. Did he not? More than one. More than one, yes, yes. So 
And his, and his father asked him, well, hasn't the Lord given us some of our own, you know? Yeah. But Samson said, no, they're pleasing to my eyes. I, I, I want that. And Samson paid for it eventually with his life. But praise the Lord, God gave him, God gave him repentance, and he, he also forgave him. Like he's willing to forgive us, is he not? It is a mistake to entertain, going on, it is a mistake to entertain the thought that God is pleased to see his children suffer. All heaven is interested in the happiness of man. Our Heavenly Father does not close the avenues of joy to any of his creatures. The divine requirements call upon us to shun those indulgences, indulgences that would bring suffering and disappointment, that would close to us the door of happiness and heaven. The world's Redeemer accepts men as they are, with all their wants, imperfections, and weaknesses. And he will not only cleanse from sin and grant redemption through his blood, but will satisfy the heart longing of all who consent to wear his yoke, to bear his burden. It is his purpose to impart peace and rest to all who come to him for the bread of life. He requires us to perform only those duties that will lead our steps to the heights of bliss to which the disobedient can never attain. The true joyous life of the soul is to have Christ formed within the hope of glory. Anybody come to mind? Paul? Yep. Yes. How about Job? All throughout the book of Job, you have three sad mentists. Bad mentists, okay? <laughs> um, telling him how, man, you must have done something really horrible to have ten, no, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but all your kids wiped out. Not only that, but Job, you lost it. Everything you own. That curse of God must be upon you, bro. Yes, yes. But the three bad ones, God, God told them specifically, th the, your, three, three, your three friends have not spoken well of me like you have. So the, the fourth one, I don't, I don't understand. Maybe someone else understands it more better. But God did specifically say to Eliphaz and the... Yeah, yeah. So it is a mistake to entertain the fact, the thought that God is pleased to see his children suffer. God does not like to see any of his children suffer. Let's go on. Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? And here's the answer. You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you don't need to despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends upon the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men cannot, I'm sorry, it is theirs to exercise. So you cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. Maybe you can think of a text. <laughs> you can choose to serve him. Thank you. Joshua 24, verse 5. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. And you already named it. Joshua's charge of the children of Israel. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. It's a, back then, in, in, in their day, they knew it was a matter of choice. They knew it was the will, the power of that God-given freedom to choose what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. Desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. 
Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christians. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. By, by yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with a power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast. And thus, through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. Amen? Who is that? Who does that remind you of? Okay. Who is the best example? This last part is about Christ. What did he say in Matthew 26? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. What was he praying to his father? Not mine, mm -mm, but thy will be done. So it's, it's a matter of being fully committed to God, but not with our own will. You can't be half the Lord's and half the world's, can you? You have to choose his will above your will. Now, I know we, we, we're all in the country here, and we all believe in the spirit of prophecy here. But sometimes, and I'll be honest with you, when I go to New York and when I come here, I see a difference. It's like night and day of the attitude towards doing God's will. I see a difference in the attitude towards the end times. But it's really about having the, the character of Christ. If you are doing your own thing, whether you're out here in the country or in the city, you're lost. Even the savior of the world had to give up his will. He asked that the cup be removed, if it could be removed. Nevertheless, not my will. He had to give that up. You might ask yourself, what does this have to do with being fully committed? Well, it has everything to do with being fully committed, being consecrated. Maybe one day you'll come into church, you'll find three people here. People will leave. Expected. People will go there, go a separate way. Maybe they'll be mad at you. You'll be the cause of someone leaving. Not, not for something evil you did. Hopefully for something that, that you did right. And even if you did, you may seek to rectify the situation, but yet people will leave. People have left here. I know people who have left here with grievances with people who are here or who have been here. And I'm being very gener generic when I say this, but this is very real. Even here in the country, people have left knowing the present truth, knowing the spirit of prophecy quotes on the church will not go anywhere. Stay on the ship, like Paul said. But are you fully committed? Are we fully committed if our spouse decides to go crazy on us in the same day divorce us, take everything, take the kids, take the money out the bank. <laughs> you want to go get gas, <laughs> your credit card is shut down. You don't know the depths of, of, of say, the enemy's power. I'm not even gonna mention his name. The enemy's power in this world over those who do not love the Lord and who have not consecrated themselves or even halfway made a serious commitment toward God. They just maybe go to church on Sabbath. They may go to church on Sunday. It's a formality them, to, to them. Time is almost up. I'll tell you a little testimony.
about 79. I was about, ooh, about nine or 10 years old, about nine, I think nine. Um, we were in Tallahassee, Florida, and every Sabbath morning, you know, my parents would be getting ready for church, you know. I would be ready, oh, I'll be half dressed, okay? And they would be in, they would be getting ready in the bathroom, and I would go and jump on their bed, just lay out, because it was a big king size bed, you know, oh, I love that, you know. I had a, what, twin size bed? I didn't have a king size bed, I'm a little kid, you know, who needs, well, anyway. I enjoyed that so much, but I really enjoyed the songs they had playing. There was this one song that I really loved, and it's a song called He's All I Need. You may know it, um, it's a really old song. Um, it was sung by a lady named Ethel Waters. Um, she was really popular, uh, I believe, was that called vaudeville? She used to be a singer, an entertainer, okay, back in the 30s or, or 20s. Well, anyway, later on, she, she, she knew the Lord. She became to know the Lord, and she sang with the Billy Graham crusade sometimes. So she's up there with, you know, George Beverly Shea. Well, Sabbath mornings, my parents would play this album, and this song came on. Oh, I just love to hear that. Well, since then, my parents moved away to, they, well, they moved down to St. Petersburg, and that was forgotten. No longer, I was grown, growing older, and I was into boy things, you know, running around. But every once in a while, I would hear this song play in my head. I would hear it, you know? You hear those childhood songs that you never forget? As time passed, I got older, went to high school, did my own thing, got into girls, got into football, got into Kung Fu and uh, yeah, all sorts of things. But do you know in the back of my mind, there was a song, He's All I Need. Just play every once in a while like a record. My conscience would play that song. The Holy Spirit would play that song. Then it would stop. I'd say, oh, that's a nice song. I remember that. Cool. Never really played it. Never had access to it. Well, the 90s go by, I get married. 2000s go by, a lot of bad stuff happens. In the back of my mind, this song still plays. He's all I need. A PK. Growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, all I think I need was a vegetarian food and Sabbath. But that song kept playing in my head. Went through a marriage. You know, that went south. Went through a second marriage that has gone south. Come here to this country, you know, out in Grand Falls. Some of you have seen my place, some of you have not. I will tell you this, it took God bringing me to this point of absolute by yourself for that song to be playing in my head again. This time, I was working with a former member who used to go here in the radio station. And I'm, being, I'm the program director, and I had to come up with, what well, not come up with, I had to find songs and content that was not only um, biblical, but it was in the right setting. In other words, no drums and no screaming guitars, okay? One of the songs that I had to search out that kept ringing in my head more clearly now that I was by myself and that song was playing even louder than ever was He's All I Need. Like, Lord, okay. All this passage of time, you've been telling me through all the bad decisions that you're all I need? Really? Maybe some of you haven't gone through that. Maybe you've lived your life, you've done the <laughs> You've done the wonderful thing from child all the way now. But I can tell you, I have not. But God has been fully committed to my salvation. He has been on a job 24-7 trying to save me. I'm going to really play for you at 12 o'clock. I'm going to play for you really quick the song I'm talking about.
That's the song that played for me over and over again. Now, just for perspective, that's over 30 years. 30 years. And I'm praising the Lord, he's keeping, he's keeping my spirit together because when I heard this, I bawled. <laughs> God is so good. This is how we have to be with other people. He works long and hard for you. Maybe you haven't sinned like I have. Maybe you haven't had <laughs> horrible decision-making tendencies like I have. But God cares for us. And that's how we have to be with people in Lincoln. Don't pass people off and say, well, they're lost anyway. That's what the Jews do in New York. <laughs> You're not one of them, so they'll have you come turn the lights on. They'll pay you for it because it's Sabbath. You're lost anyway. But we can't be like that. If we serve God, he is as patient as with us, giving us an example of how we should be patient with others. We have to be fully committed. If you are the only one in this church, I'm gone even. If you are the only one, and we all have left. You have to be so willing and fully committed to Christ that you're willing to bring souls in to fill even my place. That's how committed you have to be. I'm telling you, this song has been playing on, in my, you hear how old it is. You can hear the scratching of the record as it's playing. That's how old it was. But that's how much God knew that that song meant so much to me as a young child. And that's what he's willing to do for each one of us. Let's remember that. 
what God has done for us, let's do for others. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for letting us know how much you have been committed to us and how much we need to daily commit ourselves to you, rededicate our lives to you A each and every day. Help us to remember this. And while you have not given upon us, Lord, help us not to give upon anyone else. Help us to reach out with loving arms that never tire of our fellow man. And Lord, we thank you because you're going to give us the power to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.